Hello, everyone. Welcome to Coffee with Kalefi. We will get started here in a minute, switching back over from the video. And we've got a few different uh, faces on the, the camera today. So uh, it's St. Patrick's Day at Kalefi, except for Cody Mack, who didn't wear his green shirt. So Cody Mack is our, uh, he's our hydronics uh, product manager. That's a new title for him this year. And then Dan Ferkus and Greg Tubbs are applications engineers, and likely the voices you'll hear if you call into Kalefi or get an email back from our tech support email address. So we'll go through a couple of the intro slides here, and then we'll get into the discussion about balancing success stories today. Okay, if you are having trouble with audio, you probably can't hear me right now, but I'll do some wild mouse movement over the tech support line that goes directly to go to webinar if you're having issues with the audio. Usually logging out and logging back in is the best case scenario there. You can get a copy of the presentation if you say yes in the post webinar survey. And then also we'll have this up uh, within a week on YouTube that you can share with, uh, with other people who weren't able to make it in person today. You can get a certificate of attendance um, after the webinar as well. So you can submit that to your authority having jurisdiction for whatever your PDHs may count for. Uh, so that's something that we'll send you with the, uh, the details about the webinar today. So um, in the trailer, if you were here a couple minutes early, we were talking about the different products that we've had over the years uh, recognized with the AHR Innovation Awards. We have a new one of as of 2022. So they created a new category called the sustainability category, and we were one of three finalists for the sustainability award for uh, a combination of the Legio mix, the thermosetters, and the sink mixers in a DHW research application because of the water and energy savings associated with that type of system. So we were really happy about that. Okay, and then Hydronics 30 is out now. So um, we're also going to put in the chat uh, a link to go to the uh, interactive hydronics. So we have this available uh, in print that you can have mailed to your house if you sign up on the website. We also have the PDF you can download and then an interactive hydronics uh, that has some additional resources uh, like in this particular episode. Uh, in this issue, there was uh, uh, this old house appearance by our, our uh, favorite presenter, John Siegenthaler, that we've linked to there. So those are some of the additional resources you'd see at that, hydronics.kalefi.com. And then also, as mentioned in the trailer, uh, we're on BIM Object with really light modeled in Revit files that you can find through the website as well. And then through MasterSpec, you can download the details for our products too. So for the engineers in the audience, we make that easy to get the proper information into kind of uh, modern design formats. Okay, next month, uh, Bob Hot Rod Roar is gonna be back at Col Coffee with Kalefi. He's gonna be talking about mixing valves. One of the things that we see a lot of is thermostatic mixing valves used in heating projects like Radiant for low temp, and we'll go through some of the considerations to make with that type of system and how to select the right valve there, among other things. And then today, we're talking about balancing success stories. So these are kind of uh, ripped from the headlines, you could say. These are projects that we've seen from a bunch of different angles through the tech support lines and through our rep networks and have taken some photos and interviewed the installers and things like that. So we're gonna kind of talk about what they were up to with these different projects. So specifically today, we are going to go over why balancing is important, talk about a few different types of styles of balancing valves, what you would notice if a system is out of balance, and then we'll go through the different case studies one by one. Okay, so to start with, I'm gonna launch a poll here, and we wanna get just a, a general idea, who is responsible for balancing on your projects? So this is, uh, as this loads here, this could be a mechanical contractor, same person that's doing the install. This could be a balancing contractor, a separate person. Uh, in some states and some jurisdictions, you can't have the same installing contractor do the balancing. And then uh, a question we get a lot, uh, are you supposed to be balancing <laughs> these projects? So we'll see what the vote is here. I'll give it another that's 15 okay. seconds. It's just optional, Max. It's just optional. Just optional, yep. <laughs> yeah. It's always optional, it just may not yeah. be balanced well so <laughs> okay then it looks like those are starting to trail off we've got a pretty tight race here so i'm going to go ahead and close this so almost a, a dead heat between 
mechanical contractors, the same mechanical contractors with 48%, and then 49%, it's a different balancing contractor with luckily just a very small number of people saying, wait, are you supposed to be balancing these? So that's a, that's a good sign. <laughs> okay, so what I'm gonna do now is kind of talk about why we need balancing valves. So one of the questions that, you know, theoretically with balancing valves is you would say, well, isn't this just another control device in the system that's creating additional head loss that's more resistance for a circulator to push its way through? So uh, that is on paper. Uh, if you had a system that was designed and installed exactly like this, Maybe there's some way that you could calculate that perfectly so the path of least resistance would be equally split between all of the different risers. Uh, Dan, is that a, a realistic thing in a lot of the jobs that you've talked about? No, it always looks great on paper, but when we get out to the job site, you can never control where that you know I-beam or, or structural support is gonna be and you know what you have to do to get around that, so probably not realistic. Let me pull up the, the difference here. So these are the as built. So it turns out that they, oh, did that get really, no, it just got weird on my end. Okay, they added a couple things that the tub's a lot bigger. There are your I-beams that you mentioned, Dan, that they're working around. There's another one down there that they had to jog around a lot more fittings. Uh, somebody added a new bathroom. There's a new sink in there. Uh, nobody insulated that riser. Uh, they didn't do a reverse return like the one on the left there. They just went straight back to save a little money on that, whatever that uh, two inch copper would be swinging back to the, the return there. Uh, so that is, let me go back a slide. That is pretty realistic, I would say, that on paper, uh, you know, this would be in balance on the left there. And that same exact thing uh, installed as is would be out of balance already. So that's where. Uh, the balancing valves come in. So um, one of the things that uh, I think that, that Bob said is that all control devices are parasitic. So that is something that is going to you know, affect the amount of energy that you need to circulate that water, but it is required for uh, proper balance of something that is a dynamic system in a real life installation. So uh, which one are you more likely to see out in the field there, Dan? <laughs> Definitely, well, we're definitely going to see the mechanical balancing valves in place and balanced. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it's also a good thing to point out too that you know you you get a reverse return setup like that. That's just guaranteeing all the risers are the same length and everything else. And we talked about it before, but it's not you know say you go you're going in different directions throughout the building and you're going you know 50 feet this way versus 100 feet that way, or it's a five-story riser and the other one's an eight-story riser and there's the you know there's just no way to make sure that they're all equal head loss like you mentioned before you know without no. without creating the most boring building that you're ever going to see so right and or right. being the only trade involved that there's no yeah. electrical to work around or there's no uh any anybody else is in the building if you get in first maybe it's more likely to look like the one on the left there <laughs> Okay, to start off with, Cody, do you want to run us through a few of the different styles of balancing valves and uh, kind of sure. how they work and how they can be applied? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we'll just go through the, the, the basics of balancing valves. Uh, it's really quite surprising how, how uh, different these balancing valves can be without anybody really realizing what those differences actually are. You know, obviously, they all kind of do the same thing in the long run. Uh, but to, to kind of go through these guys here, uh, the first of which is going to be the manual uh, static type balancing valves, and it's referred to as pressure dependent here. And, and what that's basically going to mean is, is that when you adjust these manually, of course, uh, you're going to basically have a, a hole or an opening, an orifice or whatever, um, that uh, it, as the differential pressure changes across those valves, the flow rate's going to change. And, and so like if you, you set it to one particular value and say, for example, you turn the speed up on the circulator or you um, add more head loss over here or whatever the case may be, your flow rate's going to change along with that differential change across that valve. Now, uh, these particular valves here, uh, you'll notice that they all, with the exception of one, which we'll get to in a second, yeah, they're all going to have PT ports on them 
which means you're going to be uh, be responsible for bringing out your differential manometer, going through the charts, and finding that correct uh, delta P in order to actually get the correct flow rate through that valve. And uh, you know, when, whenever I talk to engineers or contractors about these particular valves here, you know. The, the general consensus is, is that this is what the engineer specified, or uh, this is what we've always done, or this is the least expensive valve that we can get our hands on. And, uh, you know, the, the problem is, is that, you know, they're, they're very inexpensive to buy up front, but what everybody kind of fails to realize is that they can be very costly on the back end, you know, where you're spending multiple days in certain scenarios going back over and over and over these valves to make sure they're all just set perfectly in order to get that proper flow rate. And, what happens in all reality, and I've had several people and contractors included uh, own up to it, you know, they, they set them to about halfway and if somebody complains, then they come back and jiggle them around a little bit more. And especially in the case of domestic hot water research, if they have to go back again, then it's guaranteed it's gonna get a bigger pump because that will fix everything. So, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, you know, it, manual balancing valves, like I said, static, they're, you, you set it, they're done and, uh, and that's, that's all you get with those things. But like I said, they're inexpensive and, uh, and that's, you know, like I said, that's what you get, so. All righty, so um, we'll go through the two different types of uh, manual balancing valves here. You'll notice the one on the left-hand side there, that's gonna be a variable orifice type. Uh, you'll notice that the PT ports, those two orange dots are on either side of the orifice. So as that plug moves up and down with the balancing valve, um, you're reading across that plug. Now versus the one on the, the right hand side there, your PT ports are actually uh, built into uh, basically a venturi, an orifice that's that's fixed, okay? Now the, the plug that you're actually changing the flow rate with or, or changing that with is actually downstream a little bit. And so the, the nice thing about a fixed orifice like that one that's on the, on the right hand side there is that it's typically a little bit easier just to do your calculations. You don't have several charts to work with and all that other fun stuff, whereas uh, the, the one on the left you've got to work off of one chart and there are several different lines uh, for where the the actual uh, stem is on the uh, on the valve and it, it could just be a little bit easier however um, with the one on the right hand side you start getting into those really low flow rates uh, the fixed orifice type uh, it can be a little bit more difficult uh, with those particular guys so you just got to be careful with that uh, as far as making sure you're getting enough differential across those valves to where it's actually readable um, I had a recent scenario come up where they they were trying Trying to uh, get to a very low flow rate, it was about 0.2 gallons per minute with a uh, with a fixed orifice type balancing valve, and the the differential across the valve was supposed to be like 0 0.07 or something like that, you know. And who, who's whose equipment's actually calibrated to to be that accurate? And and again, once you start changing anything else in the system, you know, um, that's going to affect the differential across that valve, which will in effect uh, change the the flow rate through it as well. And so this guy is kind of an iteration of a manual balancing valve. It's it's going to have a, uh, a, a a valve right at the top there. I, I'll, I wish I could use your cursor there, Max, but but that's all right. So you're going to have a valve right there at the top that's going to be able to uh, increase or decrease your flow. But what's unique about this guy versus a lot of the other ones is that being a static manual balancing valve is fine, but it also includes a flow meter that's built right into the front of it. And you'll find this on certain valves where uh, it, it's just going to basically make life a lot easier. You're going to actually have flow going through the valve. You're going to pull on that pin there, and it's going to create a bypass path. You can follow that red line through there. And as it creates that bypass path, you're actually seeing what the flow is on the outside of the, the flow meter. Uh, this particular model, it's called our 132 uh, series quick setter. We actually have this in low lead as well as hydronic only versions. Um, but, but this is a, a really unique valve in the fact that literally anybody could go up to it and pull the pin, see the flow and adjust it. You don't have to have really any special tools besides your, your universal uh, metric crescent wrench. And, uh, and like I said, you just put that guy on there pull the pin and, and adjust it where you need it and, and walk away. So, so you'll see that, you know, obviously there's, there's more brass involved with this guy, but you know, you're going to spend a little bit more upfront to save a lot of money on the back end with, with a product like this. And for verification for commissioning, if you're an engineer and you want to walk through, you don't need to find the tools to double check it just to see, wait, is this, is this circuit even on right now? You can just pull <laughs> the, the pin and, and see if that's the case. Yep. All right, so the next one is going to be an automatic balancing valve, and this is uh, versus static. This is going to be dynamic, meaning these guys will actually adjust and, and do 
do work on their own um, to, to maintain a, a fixed flow rate. And so uh, what a lot of these guys have in common is that they're going to have a cartridge built inside of them that is set to a, a fixed flow rate. You know, it could be 0.5 gallons per minute, it could be six gallons per minute or whatever. And, and what you've got in that cartridge is a spring-loaded piston. And that spring-loaded piston, as it moves up and down, you'll actually notice on the side of that cartridge, there's a kind of a characterized Y cutout there. And as the differential increases across the valve, that piston's gonna get pushed down and it's gonna start closing off some of that characterized cutout that's there. And through the use of that, that calibrated spring and piston, you're actually gonna be able to maintain a specific flow rate across a wide range of differential pressures. So you'll notice there on the right-hand side that every one of these types of uh, pressure independent type balancing valves are gonna have a control range. It could be two to 14, two to 32, whatever. And so once it's between that, that range of two to 32, uh, for example, it's gonna be able to control to that specific flow rate. Now, once it gets past 32 PSI differential, which obviously is a pretty darn high differential, but once it gets past 32 uh, differential, uh, it's gonna basically just turn into a fixed orifice at that point. When, and, and, and that's when you're gonna go back to kind of that static balancing valve scenario, where as the differential increases past 32, it's gonna start going up slightly more and more and more. Um, so whenever you have a balancing valve like this, uh, you're typically gonna wanna make sure that you add a little bit more head to your pump. You'll notice that in order to actually get in the control range of the cartridge, you'll have to have a minimum PSI differential of two. So you want to make sure you're going to have to add another, say, five feet ahead to your pump uh, on top of whatever your head loss is for that furthest circuit in order to make sure that guy's going to work. But these guys are are awesome. Uh, we sell a ton of these guys, uh, especially in uh, uh, multifamily residential type applications and whatnot, where they, they put them in. And as long as they get the flow direction correct, uh, they're golden. You know, they don't have to go back. They don't have to adjust it. But we do have, uh, there are certain models out there. You can see in the middle there, that one that kind of looks like a Y pattern. What's nice about these is that you can actually go back and confirm that they're within their control range. And that's kind of one of the downsides about pressure independent balancing valves is that how do you, how do you create a balancing report in order to take that back to make sure that it, you know, to get occupancy and all this other fun stuff. Okay, so, so with this one in the middle here, you can actually go ahead and put a differential manometer across it. You don't, you're not actually adjusting anything, but you're actually just verifying that it's within the control range that the valve needs to see. So I don't know if you want to add anything, Max or Dan or Greg. I mean, feel free to jump right in on that one. Like I said, a very easy valves to work with. Um, you know, the only downside to them is that it's not going to typically be a stocked item for a wholesaler. It's going to be more of a, a built to order kind of item. And the, right. uh, so the one in the center there is going to be a Q2 available in, in May. And then the one on the bottom that we've had for a few years is, is available now. But like Cody said too, that generally this is a job specific order that there may be 60 of them. And, um, you know, there are even times that we've bulk packaged them um, in order to get those to the job site with, um, you know, minimal shipping and things like that. Sure. I think the most common question we get about those once they're ordered and put in is maybe somebody figured the wrong flow for a certain branch. We'll get a phone call asking about getting a replacement cartridge and we do have those available you'll get the new characterized cartridge if it's a bigger or smaller flow rate mm -hmm. and the label with it to be able to you know correct that that label that's on the existing valve body that you have installed so you swap out the cartridge you replace the label saying that you know the, the flow, rate, flow rate has been changed that's a great point to bring up greg yeah. you know you've got a a static balancing valve a manual one if it needs to be changed you just go back and change it you, you got to have all the specialized equipment and everything else but you've got a product like this if you want to change it you're taking it apart you know and, and that uh, is kind of a hindrance in some cases um so that's a great point to bring up hmm. <clears throat> all righty so the next one here is going to be um, specific to uh, balancing domestic hot water research applications, okay? And, uh, you know, the, the, the models prior to this, you know, the, uh, the manual static balancing valves, the pressure independent dynamic type balancing valves, those were, could be hydronic or um, domestic hot water applications for research. Um, but what's unique about thermal type balancing valves is that they're, they're actually balancing based on a temperature. They're, they're modulating based on a temperature. And, and obviously with hydronic, you're specifically looking for a flow rate. Um, you can also calculate that flow rate. Obviously, that's what everybody should be doing, calculating the flow rate you need in each individual domestic hot water research branch. 
um, in order to figure out the heat loss and or you know maintain that that uh, temperature to the last fixture. But what's unique about these guys is that they're going to have a thermostatic element in them, and you're going to have a knob on the top, or you know it might be a preset temperature that you're actually uh, have that cartridge in there, and it's set to a temperature based on the knob or the preset uh, cartridge that's in there, and it's going to open if the set point gets or if the the actual fluid gets lower than the set point, and it's going to start to close off if the the fluid's getting higher than the set point. Um, so with this guy here, it kind of for for domestic hot water research, we've been seeing this as kind of like the the path to the future as far as uh, as far as domestic hot water research. We get a lot of contractors that use these types of balancing valves, these thermostatic or thermal balancing valves, and and they don't want to go back to anything else. Uh, they they it saves a lot of callbacks, a lot of headaches, and everything else. And so. You know, like I said, what's great about these in domestic hot water, you, you put them in, you set them to a temperature or you have a preset uh, uh, temperature in the cartridge and you, you literally walk away. It's as easy as that. Yeah, they're real handy. Um, I hate to call it like a, a trouble job valve, but it really is when you have an existing <laughs> system and you're having problems with dead legs, nobody knows what kind of piping is in there so to try and figure out the losses and figure out exactly what you need in an old building with everything buried and existing, this is a way better option. I was yep, going to say it's kind of your problem solver valve when you yep. pair that with a variable speed pump. It, the two just work really well together. Extremely well. Gives you a little little fudge factor, a little wiggle room. You know, right, yes. um, you think it's supposed to be a half gallon per minute, but it's supposed to be 0.6 gallons per minute. This guy can help you make up the difference, you know, um, and it's going to do its thing. And and so like like Greg mentioned too, you you set this guy up with a variable speed circulator, and as these valves start to modulate, open and close, that variable speed circulator can ramp up and down with it. Now, one thing I have seen uh, from engineering side as well as the contractor side is that there's a number of circulators out there, variable speed ones in in particular that have the ability to ramp up and down based on what the temperature they're seeing back at the circulator. Okay. Now I, I will say that that's kind of, uh, they're kind of working against each other. If, if you're installing a thermal balancing valve and you've got a circulator that's going to ramp up and down based on the temperature right at the circulator, you, you don't want to do that. You, you want to basically uh, set that circulator to a constant differential or some type of an auto adapt mode or whatever and let the thermal balancing valves do the work on that end. Um, otherwise, they're kind of going to be kind of fighting each other and you don't want to deal with that. So, um, you know, if, 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 uh, if you get into that scenario, like I said, just kind of forget that that sensor is there on that circulator and just set it to a constant differential. I don't know that we've ever had a, a mention of the thermosetter without saying that it's a, a temperature solution to a temperature problem, which I think right, is exactly. kind yeah. of the, the key yeah. piece here. You can absolutely balance a, a research system with any of the other valves that we've talked about. This is the one that's actually you know dynamically using the temperature at the time to, to make the decision, which I think is important. Yeah, and it makes the system super efficient by essentially modulating open and closed, up and down. And, and make an effective use of the pressure you have in the system. Yeah, we want to leave that hot water in the tank unless we need to move it around to keep the, the fixtures happy. It's, it's better in the well-insulated tank in the basement than it is spinning around the building and dissipating heat for, you know, for nothing. So, uh, Dan, when you get a call about uh, a product or anything, what are some of your, you know, aha, that might be a balancing things that come up? What do you, yeah. what do you notice in those calls? Boy, you know, I, I was thinking about that and I kind of thought about, you know, okay, what's a heating call I took recently? And I, and I had a contractor that called in and this happened to be a residential project. Um, and it was a home that had, you know, a first floor, a second floor, and then they put on an addition and first floor and second floor were, um, one was fin tube, one was radiator, and then the addition, the, the homeowner wanted in floor, and but the homeowner didn't want to opt for zoning. I mean, that would be a great yeah. case scenario for zoning, but he didn't want to opt for that. So they're trying to run that off of one circulator and one system. And one thing he noted is a lot of hot and cold spots in the home. Um, so he came back, he put a bigger pump in. Um, and then as I, we were talking about that, he was still having hot and cold spots, but now he was having a lot of pipe noise you know, a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of velocity in the pipes. So, you know, that's where we started to, I started to dial them back. We looked at flow rates and required flow rates and, and talked, helped them with looking at pump sizing and then putting in balancing valves to get that correct flow rate in the right spot to be able to 
you know, attempt to even it out if, if they're not going to go to, to a zoning application. Um, yeah. And kind of similar with a plumbing call. I mean, I had a plumbing call not long ago where, you know, it was a, a multi, multi-level, you know, apartment building. And the one thing that they had noted is that when, you know, they're at peak use, you know, during the day, it doesn't seem to be an issue. They get hot water relatively quickly to the fixtures. Um, but one thing he noted is that at a time of low use, like the middle of the night, you know, some of the apartments or floors closer to the mechanical room seemed to be fine. But as they got further away or higher in the building, you know, it seemed to take forever to get to get that water temperature, you know, at the fixture. So, you know, that's where I talked to him about, you know, what, what do you have in place for balancing? You know, is there something we can go back and add to to balance that out so that when there is no no use in the building that you have that even consistent temperature? Yeah, that most hydraulically remote fixture that's just at you know right that off hour is not going to get the right flow, and that that seems like that has come up a bunch of different times. Yeah, we had a, a project that I think that you had talked about um, that was a hotel in New Jersey. That's not one of the slides that we have today, but uh, the amount of front desk calls that they would get from the, the penthouse room that was just in that top corner that they couldn't right. get hot water for 45 minutes and then were able to rebalance it with thermosetters in an existing building is is kind of exactly uh, what you can fix by you know readdressing balancing. Yeah, and the, ba the the issue really showed up at a time of no use, you know, when, mm -hmm. you know, somebody would wake up in the morning and the first first couple of people up in the morning opening their fixture or finding that it takes a long time to get the hot water there. But when they're during the day and during peak use, you know, now everybody's using hot water and, and they didn't see the issue as, as much. Yeah. I Great, think another perfect. thing to bring up, too, uh, is, you know, you look at symptoms of this. Some There are some building maintenance guys and even contractors that think it's okay to be replacing pinhole copper pipe. You know, <laughs> if, if, if if you get that scenario, that's a balancing issue. That's a symptom of an improperly. It's not that they, uh, you know, it's not like copper's worse than it was before. You know, this is this is a balancing issue. And, uh, and so we need to take care of that. Right. Or just thicker, thicker wall. We need K are... copper. We need K copper. So it takes 30 <laughs> years to go through right. it as opposed right. to yeah. a bigger pump. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we also had a quick question here, too, uh, <laughs> that I saw here. They asked if we'll be producing thermostatic valves for hydronic heating or cooling applications as opposed to just domestic hot water research. And I, I had to think about that for a second. And it, it dawned on me that we already do. We actually make uh, thermostatic control heads for like a lot of your panel radiator type applications. They're not, they don't look like your conventional type balancing valves, but that's exactly what they do. It's based on temperature in the room uh, that that thermostatic control head on a panel radiator will open and close and modulate the flow through that panel radiator or whatever you have it connected to. So uh, that was a, that was a good one, Ivan. Uh, you know, like I said, doesn't look like your conventional type of a uh, balancing valve, but, uh, but it definitely does the same, same thing as, as that yeah. uh, thermostatter. Yep, it modulates the flow through either a panel radiator or an old cast iron radiator or a baseboard for that matter. We got yep. a lot of them out there being used in that capacity. Yep. Okay, so for this first project, uh, so this was a new hotel build in Florida. Uh, Performance Plumbing was the contractor. Uh, they do ground up plumbing, gas lines, everything. Uh, for this particular project, they went with the Legio Mix rack, which is uh, kind of fun for us to see because Dan and Greg build these in the shop. So we kind of see the, the full circle uh, with this. So this is just a single part number that comes with you know, everything basically inside of that, that green box there of the Unistrut we ship as one piece and then you put it into the system. Uh, so they were in charge of the, the whole plumbing system here. They used the Legio Mix station and then they use thermosetters and sink mixers. So um, we got a call, Greg, you got a call about setting this one up. So what do you walk people through at this point when it, you know that it's a Legio mix rack and thermosetters and, and sink mixers? We walk through quite a bit of different things with these, but I think the most common thing is you got to understand it's usually a plumber that's there just doing the plumbing. They see wiring, they see a control, they're really not sure they're out of their element. So what we end up getting them through is a lot of times the wiring. Um, once it's wired and, and turned on, they see all the lights come on the control. What do we do next? So we walk them through setup. You know, all right, you got to set your date and your time, get through the anti-clog cycle, 
which takes a little bit of time. Once you do that, then you can go in and adjust your, most of the time they're doing just basic electronic mixing, then you're, you're setting your set one temperature. You know, from the factory it's set at 113. Typically that's not hot enough, especially if you're running a sink mixer and all the other, uh, you know, appropriate pieces of, of equipment in there you're going to want to boost that temperature higher. You might want it 125. You might want it higher or lower than that, depending on your losses. And it really, no two systems are the same. So you might have to play with that a little bit, but we get them through a lot of that uh, basic setup stuff and just reassuring them, you know, what they're seeing on the screen. So for this particular job site, uh, what wiring do they have to do in the field? Yeah. in this one, literally it was plug and play so yeah. you see the power cord there and the power cord goes down below in the bottom right there's a plug-in transformer plug it into the wall and and it's ready to go yeah so, so that i yeah i like to bring that up because there's just there's not a question about sensor locations or you know does no, this wire no, go here or no any of that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we wire everything here we plug it in make sure it powers up and uh it, it gets created up and sent off to the job yeah, so this was a great fit for the Legio Rack to just be able to do this install in a new construction setting really quickly. Uh, and then just a little bit of, you know, is this is this right on the phone with Greg, which is a, a phone call that we always like, I think. <laughs> yeah, I like yeah, I prefer appreciate that. that. We yeah. really appreciate that. And even if you're don't don't even second guess it, just call us right off the bat. We want those phone calls because we would hate to see you set something wrong in there and then have a problem with it later and get a phone call and return visits are never fun for something silly. But I think so, that's what's important is we always confirm your application. So, you know, you're not gonna have it set up for thermal disinfection if the rest of the building is not set up for that. Right. And that's probably a good segue to the next slide here. So, um, I'll read the, the quote here and then um, I've got a question for Cody. So this is from the, the contractor, Randall Langley. Uh, so he was a little weary about thermal balancing, uh, but what they ended up finding is they saved the day um, in this hotel. And this wasn't even you know like a 50 story hotel or anything like that. Um, this was a you know, two or three stories, I think. Um, so like a you know, smaller airport hotel or something that they were able to get off that job really quickly, you know, in a, a COVID era of construction, that's a pretty valuable day to be able to move somewhere else. So Cody, um, what does thermal disinfection ready mean? What would a, what would that system look like? Well, so, uh, so with that in mind, I mean, we've talked at great length in many webinars over the years about thermal disinfection. The idea behind thermal disinfection is that you use high temperature water to manage the growth of Legionella bacteria. And I say manage because you're never going to kill all of it 100%. And as soon as you get more fresh water into the building, there's going to be more Legionella along with it. But you want to minimize the risk of that Legionella bacteria as much as possible. So when we talk about high temperature water, we're talking 140, 150, 160 degree water in order to to kill off this Legionella bacteria or, or to, again, to manage it the best, best way possible. And so when you start talking about that, like engineers and contractors get real nervous. You know, the idea of sending 150 degree water down your distribution um, is something that you need to be really leery or very careful with because you know, obviously you want to protect the occupants of those buildings. So whenever you do get into a scenario like this where you are potentially going to be doing thermal disinfection or you are going to be doing thermal disinfection, you need to make sure that you've got under sink mixing valves or thermostatic uh, uh, type fixtures, whether it be shower valves or uh, labs or whatever the case may be, something that you can limit the temperature coming out of those fixtures so somebody doesn't get up at three o'clock in the morning when you, you're normally gonna be doing your thermal disinfections during the, the times of very low demand. So they don't get up at three in the morning and then turn on the faucet after they go to the bathroom and it's called themselves. Obviously, uh, that's something that you wanna avoid. Again, protection of the occupants is first and foremost with, with any building, with any code too for that matter. Um, so with, with that in mind, what they did here is they basically got it set up to where they've got a device in our Legio mix that uh, has the ability to, to manage and schedule thermal disinfections. They're using point of use mixing valves at, at all the fixtures to make sure you're controlling it at that, that, that final destination. And they're also using balancing valves that kind of coincide with that. And, and uh, we, we make a thermal balancing valve, for example, um, that, uh, you know, it, 
controls based on temperature. And, you know, we talked about it before. If you say, if you set that thermal balancing valve at 110, um, what happens when you start jamming 150 degree water down the pipe? Obviously, it's not going to, it's going to want to close off as much as possible. And so within our thermal balancing valves that we have to offer, we have the ability to add a second cartridge next to it that can create a bypass around the first cartridge. So if you are doing thermal disinfection, it will allow that cartridge to bypass the first one, increase the flow rate, and get that thermal disinfection application done as quickly as possible. And that came up with a, a project that a few of us were on a call in, in Denver recently that, you know, thermal disinfection is not something that uh, there are many, you know, jurisdictions that are saying you must do this for a new hospital build. I mean, maybe the VA or somebody will be the first one to, to do that, but it's it's not something that is, you know, demanded by any uh, authority having jurisdiction yet. Uh, but by just having this system, you can just replace the cartridge later and it, it's really you know, just a change of a, a cartridge in these existing thermosetters, and you'd be able to do thermal disinfection down the road without, you know, redoing all of the balancing or anything like that. You just take that out. And I've got a slide that I'll show uh, a graphic of that a little bit later, but yeah, that's that's kind of what we mean by thermal disinfection ready. And, and until that day, it's just a, a good, you know, uh, system for regular DHW research. And that's that. This is kind of the exact graphic that we submitted for that AHR Innovation Award. Uh, that they thought was a, a great pick for sustainability reasons for water saving and energy saving measures. Okay, I've got another poll here. Let me launch that. So this next one is plumbing specific. Um, which valve do you typically use? So let me start that. And while we're waiting for the poll questions and everything, Max, too, um, we've had a lot of great questions within that questions box that uh, that we put out there. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, to bounce that in there. If we don't get to you uh, today, we will definitely uh, follow up via email and everything like that. Um, you know, we want to make sure that if there's any thoughts going on, you know, uh, any doubts or anything like that, that we can help uh, kind of steer you through them. So uh, or any questions you might have. So definitely check that out. We've got another tight race here between these different valves. I'll give it another 10 seconds or so before I close it down. Yeah, you're right. It is a it is a pretty tight race. <laughs> All right, let me share that with everybody. So the winner uh, barely, I guess, would be a manual fixed orifice valve. Um, and then it looks like a good mix of, of everything there. So variable orifice coming in second place with 27% and then automatic and thermal um, both in the, the 20s there. So that's uh, that's interesting. I didn't know what that mix would be, but that's a pretty good distribution of, amongst those different styles. I think it's a good thing to point out too, Max, that, you know, uh, there's a lot of times I talk to engineers and they'll, a lot of times on their plans, they'll have a balancing valve in there and they'll just say typical and they won't actually call out a, a model number or a, a manufacturer or anything in some cases. And, uh, you know, you leave that up to the discretion of the contractor, whoever is the one buying the valves, you know, uh, sometimes you're going to get stuck with a ball valve in there and then they will argue with you that a ball valve is indeed a, uh, a balancing valve uh, when in, in all reality, it's not that great of a balancing valve. And so, so with that in mind, uh, you know, having something that you can specify or a type of balancing valve you can specify, especially one that's going to be like that automatic type balancing valve or a thermal balancing valve, um, not only is going to make the job go smoother for the contractor, but it's going to be less callbacks to the engineer because, you know, they're, they're saying, well, you, you designed the system, you know, kind of thing and, and pushing right. it back on them. So, so yeah. Okay, so the second project here, so this is a uh, Mashpee and Quashnet, uh, a middle school, a high school and a middle school. Um, and this, they also have a, like a lab. Uh, so they have three different Legio mix, uh, mixing valves on this project because it's kind of a big campus. So uh, Bob Lee was the contractor here. He's a cool guy to talk to. He also has this other business where he sells like 36 million BTU, BTU portable snow melt machines like boilers that you can move to an airport or something if you got two feet of snow so you can melt the snow and dump it in with a front end loader or something like that so works on a lot of cool different systems but was uh, involved with this because it was a tricky retrofit so this is an existing school that they wanted to add thermal disinfection to uh, which could be a little you know difficult to do so we'll go through some of the um 
at the things here. We've got a chat question next. So this was something that came up uh, at this project is they installed the um, the Legio mix to the point of distribution mixing, and then they went to try the thermal disinfection cycle. And one of the different parts of the building, the return was coming back too cold to effectively meet that thermal disinfection window. So it wasn't at least hitting the, you know, from memory, 140 degrees for a half an hour. They weren't getting it back hot enough to to disinfect what they were recirculating. So Greg, now what do we do? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's not, it doesn't just happen with this job, right? I mean, we get this phone call quite often where, okay, we put it in disinfection mode. It's not coming back hot enough. Maybe we need to put a bigger pump in. Mm, probably not. I'm, I'm guessing that you probably had this thing engineered. So you have the right size pump there. Well, and another thing to look at too is the, the losses of the piping, the lack of insulation on the piping. Those are two big key features. So what do you do? You put a balancing valve in there. You put, in this case, they have three in the main part of the building. One's for the science lab area and the other two go for other parts in the main part of the building off of the one of the Legio mixes. So they were able to then balance that out so they were getting the proper amount of flow back through all three of of the return risers going back in and they were able to verify and and complete the disinfection cycle and i believe with this project too they're you know in the programming we start as conservative as possible to try and circulate 140 degree temperature verifying it at the return not just leaving the mixing valve but seeing that it's actually coming back that warm for 32 minutes mm -hmm. but I believe in this case they actually adjusted the set point for thermal disinfection too. So they went 10 degrees higher with the, you know, with that Correct. and went for a shorter window to make sure that they had enough temperature to get to that coldest loop. Like you mentioned, you know, who knows what the insulation looks like in this older school? Uh, this wasn't something that was to code today. You know, who knows what was in there? Who knows if you can even see it? So those were a couple of different ways to to iron out the kinks with with this particular job site. Uh, another one to, to bring up too is uh, cross connections. Uh, anytime yeah. you have a cross connection in a building, uh, you know, say you've got a failed shower valve, uh, a single handle shower valve or a failed single handle faucet, you know, or something like that, where the path of least resistance for, you know, water to flow is going to be through the cold, through the cartridge and then out the hot, you know, how, out into the hot riser again. And so with that in mind, you know, as that flow takes the path of least resistance through the cartridge, it's going to drag down your research temperatures like crazy. And whoever's past that, that failed cartridge or that, that cross connection, you know, on the riser or on the run or whatever is, is going to be complaining that oh my gosh I don't have enough hot water and everything else and and again they're you know especially since a lot of these pipes are just all buried in the wall like how do you how do you diagnose that it can be very tricky very difficult in some cases but uh, as thermal disinfection becomes more popular I think uh, the prevalence of cross connections and uh, the idea of making maintaining that research temperature properly is, is going to be more and more prevalent. And Dan, you had a project that's not one of our slides today, but it was a, a hotel in Wisconsin that with the data logging of the Legio mix, you were able to track down a cross connection for some sort of like laundry or what was it that was at a yeah, specific no, it was, time of day? It was interesting. Yeah, I had a call from the contractor and I was actually out on that site and helped them with the setup. Um, but and the valve had been in for about a year and suddenly they started to receive complaints that, you know, they they weren't having enough hot water and and as I talked to them they're like yeah it happened the last three nights in a row and I'm like okay do you know when it happened yeah we're not really sure I'm like okay let's look in the log so we were able to go into the data logging feature in the Legio mix and we we're able to see that the last three days in a row at 6 p.m. they reported a drop in temperature and they were able to then look at okay what's happening here at 6 p.m. that could be affecting this and it ended up coming down to um, a cross connection in a mop at a mop sink. So, yeah, those are pretty famous. That <laughs> pretty famous for a two-handle faucet there with a with right. a hose connection on it, and then they'll usually put like a, a Y on there, and then they'll shut off flow at the Y uh, at the outlet of the faucet, and then leave the hot and cold on, which is literally a direct mm -hmm. cross connection from one side to the other. And and yeah, that's where you can run into problems. But, right. but that, nice... that data logging feature really helped simplify their troubleshooting they were really impressed with that 
And the fact that they didn't say it was a failed mixing valve because uh, exactly. that's usually like the everybody makes <laughs> a beeline for that that particular I, I, scenario. I think that yeah, I think that's why that valve. call was coming in because it, yep. they thought it was a mixing valve problem, and the mixing valve helped yep. detect another issue. So this is the the graphic too. So this is kind of what I was referring to with thermal disinfection ready. That you can buy this uh, this thermostatter on the bottom here. Uh, with a plug in that second port and then go back later and either put in a, thermo a thermostatic cartridge that will open when you're in uh, uh, disinfection mode or you can toggle it open and close with the 24 volt signal. So you could install the system uh, and maybe it's in a, a building that one day you imagine it could ask for thermal disinfection and you're really just replacing a, a plug with a, a thermal cartridge or an actuator, which is a nice option to have um, and is something that you can say that it is kind of ready for the next step if that if that happens as an engineer too. So I think we kind of covered all the differences there at the Mashpee High School, they actually do it with the building automation system that those are gonna use the 24 volt cartridge and open it manually um, in that case. But some people will even put the, they'll take out the temperature uh, gauge there and put a, a thermistor in there to take back to the building automation system too. So then you've got an additional data point of what is that riser temperature right now in real time from a computer. Okay, so this is a project that we did this case study about 10 years ago, and it's just one of our favorites. Uh, it was a rope factory. Uh, now it's probably a $600 a night luxury uh, hotel um, <laughs> called the Wide. And it, this was a funny one because we actually found some information about it in like a, um, a fashion magazine, like as some, you know, check out this incredible hotel. But so let's say, Greg, you're in charge of uh, converting an old rope factory into a luxury hotel. They're putting in Radiant. How do you make sure that that's not a big, drafty, uncomfortable poorly uh you know hot and cold spot situation <laughs> what what do you go with there yeah and uh, well i mean if we're doing radiant floor i mean it's easiest to, to balance right at the manifold because you in a manifold system you have varying lengths of tubing typically so using the balancing valves in the manifold itself are ideal now if you have a perfect world situation or you have a basic manifold where you don't have the ability to uh, to use flow meters that are on the manifold, you can either install flow meters underneath between the tubing and the manifold, or if you knew exactly what your flow needed to be through that entire manifold and it's a perfect world situation, 132 is a great option for it. Yeah, we've got a picture here. So they did a, a 132. These, you know, this was a warehouse space, so this could be a good fit for, you know, maybe it's just every zone is a big square and it's easy to get the the loops the same length. This isn't, uh, you know, a small zoned residential situation where you've got a hundred foot loop and then the rest are 300 foot loops or something like that. So you can balance that with a single zone valve and a 132, which is what they did in in this case. Um, and then Don Rath, one of our, our longest standing reps, I think, with uh, Kalefi, was involved with this project that many years ago uh, and was really pitching the, you know, the skill to, to balance this is, is not easy. Um, this 132 is a great fit because you can just pull the pin and look at the flow rate and, you know, pitched it as a, a really installed cost, huge savings instead of having to send somebody back through every room of this hotel. Uh, with the manometer to, to balance. This was something they were able to do really quick. So uh, definitely a project that we we like, and I think that we should, that the four of us should go stay there at some point. It seems <laughs> like we can split a room, because uh, there you go. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Budget conscious. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I've got the last poll here. So in the context of just hydronics, so just heating and cooling, which types of balancing valves do you typically use. So we've you know eliminated the thermostatic uh, here since that's just a plumbing only product. So we'll launch that and see as those numbers come in. This is going to be like a a hard set of polls to figure out what's going on because we've got a, our third like dead heat yeah, <laughs> I can that. choices here. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll give it another 10 seconds or so, but we're, we're pretty close to you know even answers all the way across these three different types of valves. Does that surprise you guys? 
Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, but, it, you know, you look at it from a, a history standpoint. I mean, people have been using manual balancing valves for so long that they're, they're just kind of that's just the way that they've been doing it for 30 years or 40 years or whatever. You know, you, we've all yeah. heard that answer before. Right. Well, and I think that this whole balancing conversation, too, it depends on who's buying the 60 valves, you know. <laughs> who yeah. is going to look like a champion for saving money on material costs versus who's going to look like a champion for getting off the job site earlier where an automatic might be a good fit because there's there's no adjustment to, to make and there's no balancing throughout the building to do after the fact. You just have to select the right product. Okay, so buy a nose. We've got the automatic ahead of uh, fixed orifice and then variable orifice being the third place there. Okay, so we've got one more project here. Uh, this was a cool one. So Biothermic is a, a design team in Canada, and um, they are working on high efficiency wood systems. So Dan, Cody, Greg, you guys live in Wisconsin. What do you think of when someone says a, a wood boiler system? What's the image in your head? You want a quick story? Oh. What, what, what I think? <laughs> I think of- A lot of smoke. <laughs> Yeah, circa 2003, uh, goon spoon in hand, a lot of dirt and mud, and burying PEX that is covered in about six inches of insulation <laughs> in the ground from a field stone basement out to this big wood boiler parked in the yard behind a farmhouse. That's that's what I see. Mm -hmm. Not maybe not very efficient. No, yeah, not at all. Smell it coming. Running, you can smell it running oh, yeah. all the time. You're, nope. you're using a lot of electricity. Um, and it's just running. Yeah, yeah, just uh, can smell like a you know a lazy garbage fire or something like that <laughs> out there. So depending um, on what, what awful uh, uh, what awful fence wood wood they put in or fence line that, wood they put in there. That's <laughs> what I was going to say, Greg. Free free wood is free wood. Free wood, you know, right. free wood. Box yeah, elder to find free wood, Cody. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> by the time I buy my chainsaw and my truck and trailer and my time it's or you no throw your back out yeah, right. yeah. The kind of yeah. so the cool thing about biothermic is they're installing these systems that they're designing really well with wood chips and wood pellets so a little bit different from that just the you know, fence wood that you would find um and they're seeing 80 90 percent thermal efficient systems and in the case study interview i did with uh, with mike uh, rudder you saying that you know canada is really the saudi arabia of wood so that's the resource they have up there it's you know widely available. They can process it into the chips and pellets that are easier to manage than throwing a log into the fire. And then they also have the kind of uh, economic tide is turning as far as the the carbon tax up there. So in a few years, it may make the most sense to use wood up there if you were on a, a propane system or something like that now, just because of the the cost of fuel. So that's not really the same you know thing down in the the states yet. There are probably some markets that you wish you had a high efficient you know, pellet boiler today instead of running on propane, uh, but it is something interesting to keep an eye on. Uh, one of the things that I'll mention for the quick setter application in this one, and I've got a piping diagram on the next slide, is, you know, Dan, why would you want to, in an existing system, say, balance the return coming into a big buffer tank? What's the advantage there? Well, the stratification is important, so you want to make sure that you're keeping that the thermal layers and you're not mixing that tank, so you want to be able to control that flow rate through that buffer tank. Yeah, so if you had you know, 30 GPM with an oversized pump just ripping back through that right. a buffer tank, you've created kind of a homogenous temperature <laughs> that you can't exactly. you know, load up and kind of sip off of like a buffer tank should. So that's where they're using some of the 132s, especially in existing systems. It's just to say, what is coming back out of this system? We want to make sure that's not going to ruin our stratification. Mm -hmm. So this slide, uh, this is kind of a, a typical piping diagram that they'll do. Um, but the, you know, they were noticing that existing systems are rarely balanced. And uh, using the 132s, they're able to, at least on the boiler side and on the system side, figure out what is happening and that's important for the, the high efficient wood boilers they're using and to see what's going on on the system side. So um, I've got kind of a uh, lightning round question for the group of you. Well, what's your, 
Yeah, oh, real ahead. quick, I was going to say, you know, you talk about 132s in, in like a wood boiler system like this is a good visual indicator of what's happening in the system. Like you mm -hmm. mentioned, uh, you know, when I was in the field, like our wholesaler uh, that we used to purchase all of our geothermal stuff through, they would they would bring into that quote on every quote that they would send us. They would have one of the Kalefi quick setters with the, the flow meter built right into it. The idea that you could actually go up, pull the pin, visually see what the flow rate is through there without having to have any special tools or a differential right. manometer or anything like that i mean it, it's it's great for contractors at all levels but especially those contractors that just dabble a little bit in balancing as opposed uh -huh. to being the full-blown balance contractor or like large mechanical contractor um it, it makes all the difference in the world so especially in a loop field you're not going to double check that you know you're, yeah. you're going to get your shovel out and see if that loop is right. a lot shorter than the other one or something like that if it's yeah manifold system and the manifold system is so much better than just the you know, single reverse return because if you lose pressure in, in one of those loops you're out of luck where with the manifold with the the uh, quick setters you'd be able to you know double check all of them and see if there's a no flow or a leak or something so right yeah that's a good exactly point. um okay so the lightning round question is what is the most underrated product in the Kalefi catalog <laughs> oh man, oh, that, man. That's, that's a toughie um i i would say <laughs> Oh man, well, I don't know. Start, Mark, been... Mark, our boss is listening. Yeah. I can't. I don't know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Put me on the spot. There it is. There so it is. The, yeah, uh, this is one that the um, that the guys at Biothermic are using um, as well. So the Therm Protect is just to make sure that the return temperature going back to your boiler or your wood boiler or whatever uh, isn't too cold to condensate. So you pick the cartridge that you want a minimum return temperature. And it's going to keep that loop warm until it's up to temperature and then it allows it to go out to the system so this was a, a cody mac install right here so this is a, a making sure that a, a cast iron boiler i believe is is not getting too low a return temperature um yeah. but man i used to be a boiler rep uh and the amount of boilers that were just ruined by uh you know bad piping questionable piping you know existing piping because the return temperature was just too low and it, it just rotted itself to death. This is a, a single valve to fix that and it's something that they're using for wood systems as well to make sure that that condensation isn't occurring uh, in yeah. uh, the boiler. It's so easy to put in, but boy, not having one will destroy a boiler awfully fast. Yeah. yeah. We get a lot of phone calls lately. We've been getting quite a few about people inquiring about it because now they're aware that condensation in a high mass boiler, mid efficient boiler, fuel oil, Mm -hmm. natural gas lp or even a wood boiler for that matter is not good for them i don't know about you but i hate hated cleaning out sooted up boilers <laughs> sooted up uh oil yeah. oil fired boilers they were awful yeah yeah a saturday having night one of these having one of these in place would have prevented that that along with some maintenance all right well let me zip through the last couple slides here um so the importance of speed limits i'll talk about this a little bit more on the next slide um but you know cody kind of in general what happens when you double up the size of a research pump we kind of mentioned this before but what what yeah. are you going to notice noise is going to be the first one you'll hear that water just you know just flying right through there um you know it typically after uh like in a copper system after an elbow you're going to have a lot of turbulence and and i mentioned pinhole copper before um pinhole copper is not it's not a, a characteristic of bad copper it's a characteristic that you're just got way too much going through there and especially at you know high temperatures and higher chlorine levels you know with domestic water potable water type applications um it's it's going to wreak a lot of havoc but there's also uh limitations too on on different types of piping and and uh you know max i know you're going to talk about this but pax yeah. is something that you really got to be careful about as well as copper too for that matter yeah and the the valves i showed on the last slide are you know typical uh speed limit valves that we would put in these automatic balancing valves and where that comes into play um is that you know, depending on the temperature, you know, so in a DHW research system, we've got hot water that's chlorinated and it's moving really fast. Those are three things that are harmful to pipe. <laughs> it's not anybody's specific pipe that's the problem. It's a pipe issue. So one of the things that generally we see with pipe sizing is that copper, you know, will be called out at five feet per second. Uh, that's in, you know, code books and that's pretty common. 
if you look at the Copper Development Association recommendations, they're saying, well, as long as it's not over 140, and then they're saying you're probably going to want to take that down to two feet per second. And then it's really you know, the same as a lot of the, the PECS people are saying at that point, too. So kind of the recommendation that I would make is that as a designer, you can just set that speed limit. You can say, you know, that you want no more than two GPM through three quarter inch copper or through um, you know three quarter inch PEX or whatever the, the case may be. And if the maintenance person comes in later and triples the size of that pump, you still have the speed limit with that one control balancing valve to make sure that you're not uh, you know ripping through that pipe in a way that you're going to pinhole it or lead to an earlier uh, failure. Uh, because it's really not a pipe problem as much as it's you know we're really just asking too much of hot chlorinated water through those systems to move that fast uh, where we can just put in the, the speed limit with the, the valve and, and not worry about changes to the system later so and what, what kind of symptoms do you see max with with pex type systems like that where they are doing high velocity and high chlorine and high temperature and all that stuff what what are they going to see i mean with the pipe so if you did like 160 degrees 24 7 chlorinated water it will start to make the the product brittle so that that nice flexibility that you have with pex um, it doesn't pinhole like like copper does but it starts to get brittle and it's uh starts to get stiff and then will eventually kind of fail that way not in a you know specific pinhole necessarily but that's kind of uh, takes the elastic the elasticity out of the the pipe and then you know the expansion and contraction as well uh, is a factor but uh still you know an issue for for any any pipe that you would put in out there yeah yeah and then you get that scenario with the building maintenance guy banging a ladder into it and <laughs> kind yeah. of thing yeah. and it, yeah, it's going to get ugly. And yeah, you wouldn't want to throw a new fitting and a new you know, shower into that or something like that because it wouldn't no. be friendly to work with anymore. You kind of lose the characteristics of the flexible pecs. So that takes us right to the, the top of the hour. So um, I'm just going to race through the last couple slides and then we'll see if there are any questions left. So uh, you've met the Ask Kalefi team uh, here that uh, also uh, they're on the phone. They're available by email. Uh, Dan and Greg do a podcast as well. So I think that's the next slide here. So you can hear them kind of telling the latest tales from the customer support lines there with some tips and tricks. Uh, Cody Mack does our five things you need to know series. This is great for like the distribution level. Anybody who maybe has you know five minutes, but not an hour to listen to a coffee with Kalefi, Cody goes through the, the quick hits there. So those are really good. And then follow us on social media. Some of these case studies came from uh, projects that we saw on uh, Instagram or something like that, we followed up with and said, this looks like a great story. We'd like to know more about it. So um, yeah, let's do some questions. Well, I think we actually hit all of them as far as the questions. There was some questions about solar uh, applications, solar thermal applications for domestic hot water. You know, uh, obviously when you, when you start talking about solar thermal, your temperatures can get way crazy you know like 300 plus degrees and and uh it's just a good thing to note that if you are balancing out you know uh different arrays of solar thermal panels and things like that um to make sure that your balancing valves are going to handle that temperature um but you know ideally you'd want something more like reverse return something that you can control a little bit without having to have specific control valves in there um so that was a good one do you have any thoughts on that max i know uh solar solar's big down by you so yeah, I would say that, you know, solar, hopefully on a roof, you can do a pretty, you know, tight reverse return to all those panels because you're not really working against anybody else. If you were, if you had three panels next to each other, a reverse return is maybe more achievable there than three different zones of radiant in a house with a bunch of other, you know, things to work around. So is a possibility there. But yeah, that, that high temperature is something that you want to look for solar specific components for anything involved there. Yeah, you know, in most cases, the because we've had we have stuff in the European catalogs for solar specific, where it's just it's it's a very similar product, just rated for much higher temperatures uh, for that kind of thing. So, um, yeah. So then there was a question there from Alex at the end there. Uh, do we have any balancing or mixing valves for the boiler return uh, to stop shocking the boiler? And I I think that was a great question there. Um, and if you want to go back a couple slides there um, to that that one with uh, the uh, the boiler uh, the thermal protec I think is what it's called mm -hmm. what we have in the catalog there. Um, that particular 
job there. What we have is, is a valve, it's a thermostatic valve that allows you to actually um, maintain a, a, a minimum return temperature to that boiler. And, and uh, <clears throat> like what, what you've got here is on the right hand side, that circulator is going to the boiler. Um, the pipe just above is coming out of the boiler. And so you've basically got a bypass right between the, those two. And this uh, valve here down at the bottom, uh, if you could point your cursor on that there, Max, that valve there at the bottom, what that guy allows you to do, oh, we missed it there. What what that valve actually does, yeah, is it actually has a thermostatic cartridge in there to basically uh, either open to the bypass or close off the bypass. And and if it closes off the bypass, then the actual flow will be going out into the system through that hydraulic separator that's on the left. And and so the the cartridge in there is preset at either say like 130 or 140 or 150 degrees, whatever you want it. And so it maintains that minimum 130 degrees back to the boiler. Now, obviously, if you've got a cold start boiler, the, the bypass is just going to be it's it's going to be short cycling right through that valve uh, until the boiler comes up to temperature. And what that's going to do is it's not going to prevent, uh, you know, 100% the low return temperatures, but it will minimize the risk of it immensely, um, especially if you're using any low temp type heat emitters like inflow or anything like that on a boiler that shouldn't be condensing. Um, so we do have those. Um, so definitely check that out. Yeah, and that, a good example of that might be, you know, let's say it's a snow melt and the glycol is coming back at 33 degrees. Uh, you don't want that to hit the, the boiler. And at a cold start, just the volume of cold water is going to be, you know, I don't know, less than a gallon just through that the, the boiler and through the um, boiler protection valve. And it's going to keep warming that up. And then as soon as it's warm enough, it, it spits it out into the system. But it keeps you from just having maybe hours of ice cold uh, glycol coming back into the heat exchanger. Um, it's going to take longer to warm up, but it's going to be protecting the boiler along the way, which is what we want. So, well, What's nice about it too is that you know, if you have that 140 degree cartridge, it's going to start to open up to the system when it sees 140 degrees coming back, but it's not going to be fully open to the system till it gets 18 degrees above that. So you build yeah. in that added boiler protection that it's not going to open up directly to your system until you're essentially at that point, 158 degrees going into the boiler. So there's a little, little bit of temperature, um, added temperature there to provide that protection as a the cooler return water starts coming back. All righty. Well, I think that pretty much covers all of the questions that we got. And, and if we didn't get to your question, we'll definitely uh, get back to you via email, but I'm pretty sure we hit everybody. Um, I think that's about it. All right. Well, great. Thanks to the uh, Ask Kalefi panel. We'll see you guys next on the, the podcast. And uh, yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in. Happy St. Patrick's Day. And we'll catch you next month. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks. See you guys.